Eventually, I'll find my way to visit you in person. Uh, but for now, we will have to do it online. And uh, well, that, that kind of works. Although I'm still unable to, to share um, my screen. That's probably because I'm just like a regular participant and not a co-host. Okay. So um, the topic of today is uh, our tool called JRLISA. And uh, the idea behind this tool is that it, it, can, it can help you in your release process. Now, you may or may not be actively involved in a release process right now, uh, but if your company, your organization is embracing DevOps, or if you have heard about uh, this movement of shifting left, which means uh, moving a lot of responsibilities that happen later in the, the, in the pipeline of building software. Now they are pushing back into uh, those responsibilities into us developers. So you may eventually have to deal with a release at some point. Uh, there are many ways to do releases and there are many kinds of applications where a release process makes sense or not. And so the tool that I'm going to demonstrate today um, helps you change or adapt your release process in certain ways so that you can automate most of the things that are related to safe release process. And the tool is flexible enough so that uh, you can use it with your existing release process. You don't have to change most of the things that you're already doing, you can adapt it. Or depending on your needs, you can go full on using this tool. And, that, and that's why I like the, the flexibility. Um, checking one more time, but um, I can't share my screen yet. Um, so while we wait for that, uh, my name is Andrew Samurai, and uh, I'm currently employed by Oracle, though the tool that I'm going to showcase today, even though it's open source, is not related to the company at all. So a little bit of the history, how we started, and then uh, I'll, I'll let you know, uh, uh, we will get ready with those slides. So I work in open source, and I like to build this, all these kind of projects. And one day, I was writing a desktop application. and uh, Building an S application is not really that different. And um, oh, here we go. And so let me share my desktop. And now you can see the slides. Great, here we go. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're already on this slide, the why. So I'm building a JavaFX application. And like an engineer, when I'm done, I create a binary and then I say, oh. There goes the binary up in, in a web page or some, some resource on the web. And I hope that the users will discover and know how to install it and whatnot. But as we know, users will prefer to, you, um, to use other tools and other means to consume your applications and your binaries. So for example, if you're on a Mac, uh, you will probably like to use a homebrew like a package manager. Or if you're on Windows, maybe it's a Scoop or Winget, Chocolatey. If you're on Linux, it's Snapcraft, Homebrew also. And, and there are a few other options. Now, besides being able to install and find your binaries in this way, uh, the users would like to see documentation and release notes and maybe it's a change log. There are so many things that you can do that are related to the binary or the metadata of your project. Now, creating these platform packages it's not really that difficult. Um, they are mostly based on, on some file configuration of metadata. And the problem is that you need to, to learn and to know exactly which are the options that you can change in each format and, and how to uh, package these things, whether it's a zip file or a tar or all other things, right? So um, here, I, here was I tried to figure out how to repackage my application, my JavaFX application. And I didn't know exactly everything that I needed to do. So I put a pause on that. And I look at other options. So I took as a integration uh, two other projects. And uh, besides writing Java code, I also write code with Go. So I wrote a small CLI utility uh, for Maven and Gradle. And I encountered the same problem. Whilst I had the binary, I needed or I wanted to 
uh, spread the word in so many different distribution channels. So I found a project called Go Release, which does exactly what I want, which is once you have built the binaries, it will create those platform packages for you. It will calculate checksums. It might sign your files with PGP signatures. I can do a lot of things, but it only does it for Go projects. I needed something for Java. While at the same time, uh, I discovered another Java project called JBank. JBank is a command line utility that allows you to launch Java sources uh, without pre-compiling them. This, this is kind of like what Java 10 allows you to do, but this works with Java 8. And you can also add dependencies to it. So if you're familiar with JShell, this is like a JShell uh, should have been uh, from the get-go. The author of JBank faced the same issues as me, and he changed his build using Gradle and Bash scripts so that he can publish the CLI to many different channels. So one day he and I, Max and I were chatting and uh, we, we thought that what if there was a tool that will allow us to do what Go Releaser did and what JBank is doing, but for all kind of Java projects. And that's exactly what this tool is. This is what exactly JReleaser is. So, Basically, what you do is you keep using the build tools that you already use in your daily way, which may be Apache Ant, Apache Maven, uh, Gradle, or, or what have you. You keep creating the binaries in the same way that you already do. And then you invoke JRLISA plus an additional metadata file, metadata that defines some information about your project. And what JRLISA will do for you is it can create a Git release on popular Git services, such as GitHub, GitLab, and Git. Uh, it can create those platform packages if you need them. So all many things are optional, but it can create a homebrew package for you, or Chocolate, Scoop, and the others I mentioned. And it can also announce the, uh, the release to many distribution channels. Most popular ones could be uh, Twitter and Slack, and uh, basic man and a few others. So how does it do it? At the beginning, the tool started as a file template engine, but it later became a execution engine. If you were to look at Go Releaser, Go Releaser has pretty much one command that says build it, and it performs all the, uh, the features that you see on the screen. Now, J Releaser has one command that works in that way. That is the orange command, the one at the top called full release. So this creates a git release, uh, it creates all the package managers and announces your project. But if you only care about uh, creating a git release and you don't care about the other things, well, you have two choices. Don't configure any package managers and invoke full release or just invoke the release command, the, uh, the column in the blue. Because what this command will do is uh, create a change log, calculate checksums, um, optionally sign your uh, uh, binaries, optionally upload binaries to J4 Artifactory or Amazon S3 buckets, and finally create a Git release. Or if you already know how to do your Git releases and you don't want to change that, but you want to supplement your releases with package managers, then you can use the column in the middle. So you can prepare a homebrew formula and eventually publish it to a Git repository. You can also create Docker images. There are a few other options that are at your disposal. And finally, if you only care about announcing your project, then invoke the green column that is just announced. And Jerry Lisa expects your binaries to be built already in the regular means that you already have. But uh, the, the last column, the one on the top, uh, at the bottom left, assemble. This one allows you to build also binaries or assemble binaries in two ways. Um, the first one is uh, cross-platform Java runtimes with JLink. So you can create a minimum Java runtime that it's bundled with your application. So that way your consumers don't have to have Java pre-installed or a specific version of Java pre-installed on the machine in order to run uh, your application. Now, the advantage of cross-platform Java runtimes is that if you are on Linux, for example, 
you can create a Java runtime for Windows or for Mac. And the same happens with the others. If I own Mac, I can create one for Windows. So that's a, a quite a big advantage. The other kind of binary that Jarlizer can also assemble is uh, native executables using raw VM. And in this case, there is no possibility yet for cross compilation. So if you want to build binaries for the three major platforms where Graal VM native image is supported, Linux, Windows, and Mac, then you have to run it in each one on, on very specific uh, operating systems. But once you do, once you have built the binaries, then you can continue with the release process. I already mentioned a few services, but this is the full range of integrations that we have right now. Uh, so you can release to GitHub or GitHub Enterprise, GitLab or GitLab Enterprise. So this is both for open source and commercial projects. It works exactly the same from the point of view of Lisa. And Gitia, this is pretty much you build your own custom instances of, of Git services and Kohlberg is another service that is built on top of Gitia. You can publish additionally your files to JProactive Factory or Amazon s Buckets. And here you have the full list of package managers, Homebrew for Linux and Windows, uh, sorry, for, for Linux and OS X, Chocolatey for Windows. You can build Docker images. JBank, which I mentioned before as an inspiration, can also uh, be used um, to uh, deploy or to launch JAR files across the networks. We are about to, we add a support for Mac ports in the next version of the Jarvis that's coming up. And uh, Scoop is kind of homebrew, but for Windows. SDK Man works in all major platforms. And finally, Snapcraft for Linux. And there's plenty of uh, distribution channels here. And uh, there's one thing that I know that um, in that particular um, piece of the world where you are currently streaming from Switzerland, by the way, that's why I have the uh, the mountains back there. But I know that Line is very popular in your area. And uh, we don't have yet integration for Line. And, uh, and maybe it's, it's important to uh, announce a release on a Line group. And if that is the case, well, that's probably one particular integration that we can add in the future. In terms of inputs, these are the things, the binaries that you already built. So we support all these options. Uh, a binary distribution is typically a zip file or a tar file that contains a very specific file structure. It's a bin directory that has the executable and the, uh, the executable launcher script. So for Windows and, and, and Linux Mac, and it may have a, uh, a lib directory with all the jars and maybe there's a license and a readme or any configuration files, any supporting files that you need for the application to run. Maven and Gradle can build this kind of files very easily. They have plugins that already provide uh, this behavior. Or perhaps what you want to do is create one single jar that contains all dependencies and is executable. This is known as a fat jar or as an Uber jar. For obvious reasons, because JRLISA allows you to assemble this kind of binaries, we support JLink distributions and Graal VM native images. And finally, uh, native package. These are uh, packages such as RPMs or Dev for Debian for Linux, uh, MSI or XE installers for Windows, or DMG and PPG packages for OS X. You can create them in many ways. Uh, the Java, the JDK 16 added a J package as an officially supported tool. So you use 16 or 17, uh, you may use a J package. And one more thing, the binary distribution. Even though we're talking about Java, it's just a matter of a file convention. So, JRLisa does not care if your project is, or it doesn't matter if your project is not built with Java, it could be built with Rust or any other kind of language. As long as it follows the structure, JRLisa will be able to release your project. So how do you launch it? So there are a few ways, if you're on Mac, uh, there, here are the, all the different options. Uh, we'll be adding more in the future. And if any of these options is not, doesn't work for you for whatever reason, you can download a release from the release page for which you have two options. Uh, the universal one for which you require a version of Java, Java 8, like pretty much everyone is running Java 8 as a minimum, or the standalone version 
uh, which is the one that contains a custom Java runtime. Uh, so you don't need Java installed. You just need to download that C file and it just comes with battery installed. For Linux, there are pretty much the same options. The difference is that in the standalone versions, we have two variants. One, that is for platforms that have been compiled with JLFC. Uh, so that means like the platforms like Ubuntu. And the others are platforms that are compiled with Muscle. So these are like Linux Alpine. And finally, Windows, uh, we have almost the same options. You know, instead of Homebrew, we have Scoop. And uh, same, same idea, you may be able to download a universal zip file or a cluster Java runtime specific for Windows. You could also use a single source file. This works like a Java script. It's actually just Java code. And you run it using Java 11. And this will download a jar file that contains everything. It will download a Java Uber jar. And once you have the jar, then you keep invoking it as you would do with the others. You can also uh, rely on Docker images that we built. We have two variants. One that works for Ubuntu, the first version, the Java Lisa Steam, and the other Java Lisa Alpine, which runs when you have Linux Alpine. Now, all of these options that I have mentioned so far work when you want to use the tool as a regular command line tool. But we also support integrations with Maven. So you can run it as a Maven plugin or as a Gradle plugin or as a set of Apache ends. So we cover a wider range of options for you to run uh, the tool. You can run it locally in your environment or your computer, or you can also run it on CI. So we provide guides for many different options. We provide a release action for GitHub Actions. And our Docker images are aware of the specifics for running on GitHub CI. So there's no need to create yet another Docker image if you are running on GitLab CI. OK, so this is another theory. Now let me show you uh, the demo. Uh, so I'm going to switch into the terminal uh, like this. And um, here I have a Git project, a project that is hosted on GitHub. So I can show you the remote. And uh, this is a project, it's called um, App, it's not very fancy, and it's a Maven project. And what this project does is a trivial CLI application and when you run it, prints out Hello World. That's everything that is done. And now I want to release this project. So the first thing I'm gonna do is make sure that everything is clear, right? I have no binaries, I have, uh, there is no target directory, so it's only the project. Another interesting thing is uh, all the commits that have been um, made in this repository look like this. You may notice that each one of them has a prefix. Now, this prefix is unique to the project. It has nothing to do with your Lisa. But if I follow that convention, I may be able to tell your Lisa to do more stuff later. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, create the release. Now I'm going to use uh, the metadata that exists on the project itself, such as the name of the project, uh, the Git configuration that I already know, that, uh, that is right there available on the Git uh, directory. Now, Jerry is can be installed in many ways. I prefer to install it using SDK man, so I can list all the versions of Jerry Lisa that I have at my disposal right now. And I'm going to make use of 080, the latest stable release. As you can see, I'm still working on version nine, uh, which will come out later in this month. So we can check that Jarlisa is actually that particular version with that. Yes, it's version 08, so that's pretty good. So we're good to go. So I'm going to invoke, uh, well, if we say Jarlisa dash H, it can tell you the list of all the commands that you have access to. But you might recall from the slides, the names of these commands match the, uh, the names that we saw in the workflow. So there is the full release command, and there's the release, and prepare, and a few others. So I'm going to invoke release right now. And uh, I say, Jerry is a release, and I'm going to tell it to Apple to configure itself based on the metadata available in the project. So I say autoconfig, and I also need to tell it what is the project version. So I say project version is going to be 100. Uh, here we go. I do this. And you notice 
that there is some metadata has been printed out about my project, when it was built, what is the current hash for the git commit, creates a change log. It tells me that tries to calculate checksums. There are no input files. So uh, it skips that step. Tries to sign files. And again, there are no inputs. So it skips that one. And finally, creates a release on that particular repository. Now, if you have done, if you have talked to the GitHub API before, you know you need some credentials, some authentication to talk to the API. So you need like a GitHub token. Now that information is sensitive and uh, you can put it on environmental variables, follow a certain naming convention, or you can do it like I did, which is put it on a special file here that you can configure. This format is TOML, but it could also be JAML, it could also be JSON, or even a regular Java properties file. So we support different formats. Okay, so now that we're done, Notice that now there is a tag here on my Git repository, the local one. And when I go into the remote, if I browse to GitHub where I can see the project here, notice that there are no tags and there are no releases. But if I refresh the page, then there is one tag and there is one release that was just released a moment ago. So this is the release I posted from my local machine. So I click on that one and I get this. I get the list of all the commits that belong to my change log. And that's it. Because I only told it, uh, I only told Jarvis, I want to create a release and I don't want to do anything more. But we can do a little bit better. For example, we can add a little bit of formatting to the change log and uh, eventually we can also upload binary. So let's do that. And um, so we go here. And now we say, I want to change the, to format the change log. So I say change log formatted. And if you are, if you want to know which formats or, or which options you can pass to release, just invoke your a release with dash H or dash dash help. I'll tell you all the options. That's how I know that I can pass in check the format. But if I click enter right now, which I'm going to do, the release is going to fail. And the reason is, that I already have a release that matches the tag. So Jerry Lizer will not overwrite your release unless you tell Jerry Lizer to do so. And that is what I'm going to do now. So invoke the same command as before, but now I pass in the overwrite flag. And when I click enter, now it's going to work. Uh, so we have, we see more options here in the auto configure section. All right. So when I go back into the remote, into the page here and do a refresh, notice that the, that the change looks a little bit different. And uh, now I get a list of contributors, but still I get no binary assets, no additional files. Let's add those files. Um, First, I'm going to build them, which is uh, invoke maven and build uh, the zip file and the tar file. Here we have them. Uh, see, these are built with regular maven plugins. Uh, so it's just regular maven configuration to create these binaries. So now that I have those files, I can do the following thing, which is invoke the same command as before. So now I pass one additional option file option and I say, I want to release this file right here. So I click enter. And once again, now notice that it's calculated a checksum for that input file. And it has uploaded two additional assets to my release. So when I go back again into the remote and do a refresh on the page, you would notice that the change log still looks exactly the same, but I have those two additional binaries. Now we could be adding more binaries in this way, but of course it makes sense if now I introduce the, the, the model file where we can add more features to our release. So that's in where now I go back to the terminal once again, and I showed you this file, the Jerry Lizard JAML file, which could be JAML, could be TOML, or could be JSON. 
Now, this file contains some metadata. This is the project section about your project, such as uh, what is the name? It could have the version number if I wanted to, uh, the, the description, the authors, the license, all this information comes very handy when you want to post an announcement using this information or to create a package manager such as Homebrew. Now we see in the release section here and uh, that I'm actually releasing to GitHub. So I'm making it very explicit besides the information that already is available on the Git repository. I will overwrite every single uh, release that I want to make. I want to sign commits and tags. And I also want to join a discussion when I create a release. And the rest of the configuration that we see here is how I'm going to format the changelog. So basically what's going to happen is that for every commit that is found that matches the conventions that I have set for in this project, I'm going to apply a label. And based on those labels, feature, issue, and task, I will, I will join them in categories. And as you can see, you may or may not use emojis. And finally, what this thing is doing, the replacers, will remove all the prefixes. I don't want to see the prefixes because they are already in a category. The default is that when you match a particular expression here, a regular expression, is that you will replace that with some text. The default text is empty string. So the net effect is that the prefix is removed. So I don't have to define that I want to replace this with an empty string. Uh, so generally, user is aware of defaults and conventions. The next things that we see here is that I want to sign the info class, the assets. I also am going to create a homebrew formula and I pass in two binaries, the zip file and the tar file. You may have seen this format before. These are mustache templates. These are the things that you see in the front end on the web with JavaScript. <clears throat> you can think of these variable names precisely as that. These are value placeholders. The name of the distribution eventually matches app, and the project version will match whatever project version you supply. So we're ready to go. One more thing that I have to do is make sure that I supply a project version. I can add it to the file that we just saw, and that will always release that version. Or I can make that file uh, be a, uh, independent of the project version so that I supply the version using a environmental variable, for example. So what I'm going to do is to uh, set a variable, get release a, a project version, equals one zero zero like this and i'm ready to invoke generalizer in its full mode now using the full release command so what is going to happen now is that it calculates the checksums for those two inputs it also signs the two files plus the checksums we can see on the upload section now there are more assets being uploaded and then comes the package phase for creating the homebrew package. And because I did not configure any announcers, uh, the announcing was skipped. So that is okay so far. So when I go back into the web page here, into GitHub, and I do a refresh, notice how the changelog looks now. We have the categories, uh, we have uh, the prefixes are gone. I also have the username here for all the contributors, which you can format in many ways, and all the release assets, all the binaries, the signatures, and the checksums. You see here, there's a join discussion button. This is because we define a discussion category. So we click that join discussion, and we get moved now to the discussion staff or the Git repository. And from here, well, you can react to the release and uh, make any comments on the release. That's the whole point of having that discussion. But recall that we also released to Homebrew, right? Uh, and that repository is here, Homebrew tab. The formula was just pushed right now. So we click on formula and we keep on here. And this is a file generated on a template. And if you were to configure this Homebrew tab, you can install this app application and you'll be able to invoke a hello world. 
So this is based on a template and there are many things that you can add and you can even supply your own templates. And this is basically what the tool can do for you. And you can think of adding more features and more packages depending on your use case. And of course, it's great if you're using GitHub, but what if you're not? What if you're using other Git services such as GitLab? Well, I have here the same project, the same sources. And what I'm going to do now is release this GitLab project just like we did with GitHub. I already have cloned this project on this directory. And in GitLab, the sources are pretty much the same. So what did I do to release to GitHub? I built the project, so I invoked Maven and I built the binaries. And I used the Releaser JAML file, which I can show you. Uh, the project section looks exactly the same, it's identical. The release section has two changes. One is that now we're releasing to GitLab. And second, there is no discussions because that is a GitHub specific feature. So we remove that out. And the rest of the configuration file is pretty much identical. Okay. So now I can do jrelease uh, full release. And this will now calculate the checksums, sign the files, upload them to GitLab, and create a homebrew formula also on GitLab. So now it's working there. So while it's creating the formula, I go back to GitLab to the web page and do a refresh. You will notice that now I have one tag. I click on the tag and click on the release. And I get all the assets as before. And I get the change log like I saw it on GitHub. And if I move to the home root tab repository, I can see the formula was just created. And the formula looks pretty much identical to the one I saw on GitHub, except for, of course, two different variations, the URL and the checksum. But we're not done yet. I mean, if you want to run your custom Gitya instance, you can also do it. Notice that there are no releases right now. So I move into um, this place where I already have my project already there. So I can build it again in book Maven. And that creates the zip and the tall. And if I show you the release model, there are two changes again. One is that now I'm releasing to Codeberg, which is based on Gitya. And there are no discussions. But also, I'm going to announce. I'm going to create an announcement just because. And I'm going to announce to a Discord channel. And we use webhooks integration. So anyone that has a webhook URL can post information to that webhook. So we are not going to expose it in, in the public as is right now. Well, because I'm doing a public presentation and the project is fully open source and it's publicly available. So that webhook URL is going to be set as part of the secrets that I have on the config file that I, that I pointed out earlier. So once that we have this, I can once again invoke full release. And this will, as you guess it, calculate the checksums, do the signing, uploading, generate the Humber formula, and finally make an announcement. There is one more thing that appears here. So when we now navigate here to the web and do a refresh, you will notice here on releases at the top, I now have one release. And I click on that one, I get the same change look as before. There's no surprise there. And all the assets. Uh, and now I can also go to Homebrew tab here. And uh, I see the formula, which looks pretty much the same as the others, though two differences. And if I move to my Discord channel, I now have a new message that matches the current time zone that I'm, again, in Switzerland. It's uh, morning for me. And here is the message that I saw on the command line. And if I click on that URL, I'll navigate back to the release that I just posted on Codeberry. Now, more things that I could show you, 
Uh, but let me say that um, we have translations of the CLI tool to different languages. And just recently, we got a contribution for translating uh, the CLI into uh, traditional Chinese. So if you want to, you can run the CLI tool using uh, your locale, and you will see uh, a combination of English commands plus traditional Chinese. There is more information that you can find about the project on the jrelease.org website. If you click on Get Started, you see all the documentation that is needed. So it tells you, again, what the tool is, uh, what are all the different phases, uh, what are the requirements within each one phase, how to get started with uh, CLI, Maven, Gradle, and AND. Uh, it tells you all the different integrations are listed right here. So it's easy to navigate to one another, say, oh, I want to know how to publish binaries to an Amazon S3 bucket. So just click there, and then you move now into the configuration page where you see, oh, this is what I need in order to use JAML or TOML or JSON or the Maven DSL or the Gradle DSL. So every bit of configuration that you find in, the, in this, this uh, website is written in the five different formats. So it's easy to, uh, to move from one to the other. Uh, there are examples. Uh, there is, well, here's the documentation for, say, you want to know how to use the Maven plugin and all the goals match exactly the same um, entries in the workflow. But if you're not into Maven, if you're into Gradle, then click here and you see also the same names, but using Gradle conventions. Or maybe you want to use AND, or maybe you want to stick with the CLI. So you see, it's pretty much the same name. So it's very easy to move from one tool to the other. There are also examples. And of course, the question may be, does JRLISA being a CLI tool release itself? Yes, it does. And here's an explanation of the latest version of our release file. We use one file uh, to release all kinds of binaries. So all the options that you saw earlier, for invoking the CLI uh, with, um, with a standalone or not, uh, the Docker images, all that is created from this single source file. Okay, so we're going to back to the slides. We have a few more minutes. So what's coming on in the future? What is in the future for this tool? Uh, we're almost done uh, in terms of feature complete for version 1.0. I think that we're going to release the 1.0 very early next year, sometime in January, maybe February. Uh, but of course, there are other Git services out there. I just mentioned GitHub, GitLab, and GitHub. But if you are hosting code on Bitbucket or Azure DevOps, that's probably something that will support in the future. Uh, besides Amazon S3, we know there are other cloud providers. And uh, we may provide support for other cloud providers as well. So you can upload those binaries to a object storage or a, an object bucket or whatever name that cloud provider uh, likes to use. And just like we did with JLink and GraalVM, you can build them from the outside or you can instruct JLISR to assemble those binaries. We're looking at integration with JPackage because there's some of the metadata for building the packages uh, that is shared within JPackage and create the release. It makes sense then for a user to be able to invoke JPackage for you. There are some uh, links that I can share for you. Uh, you saw already jerrelaser.org, the website of where you can find all the documentation of the project. The project itself is hosted on GitHub. Uh, it's fully open source. We accept all kinds of contributions. Uh, we have other projects associated with the journalist organizations, such as the, the GitHub Action, uh, the, uh, the Homebrew Formula for journalists, and a few other things. Uh, if you find the tool useful for your work and you would like to uh, sponsor us while well, we have an open collective, and of course, we have a Twitter account. When we tweet about our announcements and the features that are coming and things that, that are interesting about uh, journalists. If you have not contributed to open source before, let me tell you, it's very, very simple. Um, 
If you find any troubles with what we saw today or any other open source library or project that you consume or your daily work, file a ticket. That's it. Uh, if you have the time and the passion, yeah, supply a patch, supply a test case, uh, supply code, but you don't have to. You don't have to go all the way and, uh, and, and provide code. It's just enough by filing a ticket when you find a bug, when you think there is a missing feature, when you think there's something that can be done to improve a project. So this works for all kind of open source projects. Uh, as I said, we are accepting uh, contributions uh, from all around the world. We have, at this point in time, 12 translations of our CLI tool in 12 different uh, languages. We don't have yet a translation to traditional Chinese for the, uh, the core of the other tool. So if I were to invoke the tool, you will see, see still some uh, messages, or at least the log that you saw earlier, uh, you will see them in English. Uh, if someone would like to help us translate it, that would be really, really useful. Or again, if you find other things that it may be missing or something that is not working correctly, let us know and we will fix it. So with this, I, I think I'm pretty much done. Uh, I thank you very much uh, for your time.